Have you checked out VanillaSoft? It's a sales engagement platform, but what does that mean, right? Well, it means that you can stop your sales reps from cherry picking leads. It means they'll make more than just two or three contact attempts. It means you could potentially triple your sales pipeline. Check it out at VanillaSoft.com. Tenbound, the world's leading research and advisory firm, 100% focused and dedicated to sales development, is now announcing the Tenbound Sales Development Conference 2020. This year, we'll welcome over 750 of the top minds in sales development to two major conferences, the New York City Leadership Conference on June 18th and the San Francisco Multitrack Conference on August 17th. Join us at both and learn from the best in sales development in these one-day experiences. Gain the latest intelligence from the 10 Bound Analyst Team, unparalleled training opportunities, and networking with the leaders in our industry at the 10 Bound Sales Development Conference 2020. Go to 10bound.com slash conference to learn more. That's 10bound.com slash conference. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. This is really exciting. I've only done this a couple times. I actually have two guests on the show who I have known for a while. I'm very excited to introduce everybody to. I've got Casey Jones, founder and CEO of A Better Jones Marketing Demand Gen Agency, and the co-host of the Other Side of Sales podcast. Casey, how are you doing? I am doing well. How are you? Oh, too good to even be allowed, I really have to say. I am really, really excited to talk with you and your co-host, who's on the show as well, Apprenticeship Director at Vendition, Ashley Early, and the MC of the Sales Development Conference, which was amazing, and the co-host of the Other Side of Sales podcast. Ashley, how are you? I'm terrible. I need some of that goodness you've got going on. (laughs) Luckily, it seems pretty infectious, so I think you're good there. I hope so. I mean, I'm really excited. I've been wanting to get both of you on the show with your new venture, the Other Side of Sales podcast. This is really interesting because you know, sales has a bad reputation, a very bad reputation, especially in Silicon Valley, of being like a bro culture. And I literally, like you walk around downtown San Francisco and everyone's wearing Patagonia sweaters and they all go to the same barber and it's just ridiculous. Why did you start this and what's your goal and mission with the podcast? So the way we started it is Ashley and I both kind of, I don't know, got a sort of bug in our ear about one, feeling like most of the sort of thought leadership and the people that seem to dominate the content, thought leadership, speakers at events, like all of these things, and especially podcasts in the sales industry are white guys. And, you know, we both sort of had this feeling separately and we're both kind of trying to figure out ways that we could work on this because it was really irritating us. And then Ashley sent me a text message, I don't know, last spring sometime or last winter. Oh no, I think it was actually at the end of January Okay, because I was on a road trip. I was driving back from actually where I now live, Raleigh, and had been marathoning podcasts in the car and thought, oh, I should be listening to podcasts that'll help my career. Let me Google search them. And every list I saw, like I did like four lists in a row and every single list was maybe one or two women and no people of color. And it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks when at the same time, the podcast that I was listening to in my car had basically a thank you note they were reading from one of their fans saying that that podcast had inspired that fan to start a podcast. And it was like a lightning bolt. It was like, oh, well, this doesn't exist, so why don't I do it? And then that was followed by the wave of terror and fear of, oh, dear Lord, not on my own, (laughs) which resulted in a quick text to Casey saying, random idea, when do you have 10 minutes tomorrow? (laughs) Why do you think that there's this lack of diversity in podcasts and just the sales thought leaders in general? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. One, I mean, I think there's a lack of diversity when it comes to sales leaders in general. Ashley and I were talking about this the other day. The last time I worked on a sales team, almost every single woman that was on that team is no longer in sales. And I know a ton of women that start their careers in sales and either, you know, don't get promoted at the same level that the men do or 
for a variety of reasons, you know, leave. And I'm in that boat. And I, you know, it wasn't exclusively because of sales culture, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't at least part of that. And, you know, I left and went into marketing and now work super closely with sales teams and sales leaders and obviously sell for my own business. But I think that's really common. And then if you look at the majority of sales trainers and the people that kind of go out on their own and create companies that kind of work in the sales space, because I think a lot of the time the podcasts wind up being started by sort of entrepreneurs that are in the space, but that are running their own businesses talking about those things. And most of the people helming those businesses are men. And I've actually noticed on the marketing side of things, the only women you see that are sort of thought leaders in the, and sort of having really big public brands, like personal brands, are women who run their own businesses. Whereas on the men's side, you know, you've know, you got people like Dave Gearhart, who is a marketer who works for another company who has a really, really big public brand, but you don't see that similarity with women. And so I think there's just a lot of different factors like at play here. But I also think a big part of it and part of the emphasis for Ashley and me is you know, this whole old adage, if you don't see it, you can't be it. And when you don't have an example of somebody else doing something, you're a little less likely to do it yourself. And we're maybe a little bit extra crazy and a little extra bold. And so, you know, we want to start to kind of turn that around and celebrate a wider diversity of voices in our space. And I think it's everything you said. And the only thing I might add to that is I think when you are aware that you are not, this sounds really weird because I've never felt like I didn't belong at a sales org. I've never felt particularly isolated. I've never been the victim of really extreme harassment or bias. I consider myself incredibly grateful because I know that is not the case for many of my peers. But at the same time, every time I look at representation of a salesperson, it's a bunch of white guys with their Patagonia vests and their Allbirds with the blue checkered shirts. I forgot the Allbirds. Yeah. Whether it's on the streets of San Francisco, in film and TV, LinkedIn and stuff like that. When all you see is a representation that doesn't look like you, it just inherently sends a message that you are not needed. And I've noticed in the past, you know, almost a year now that we've been working on this project I've had a lot of crises of confidence of why does anyone care what I think? Why would anyone want to listen to this? You know, what have I done that's that special? Who really cares? And the thing I keep coming back to is how many other women and other people who consider themselves a part of the minority, who consider themselves lucky to have gotten as far as they have in their careers, not because they're not skilled, but because they were able to capitalize on opportunities that they got that they're keenly aware not everyone gets, have had that conversation in their head of saying, who really cares? Who wants to hear from me? And said, no, no one wants to hear from us. Or, oh, no, it's too risky to my career. I've been fortunate enough. I shouldn't be risking it by potentially saying something that could alienate some clients. That's a terrifying thing. And it's still something that I'd be lying if I said I wasn't still scared of. And especially as salespeople, I always kind of laugh when I see people jump on their videos and stuff like that. And they're sharing, everything's awesome. We're killing everything. You know, even like you're opening, David, and you know, I love you. Like, you know, like everything's great. It should not be this great. <laughs> like I just inherently, anytime I see My something that is off. that good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's why we do these audio. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. I know. No, point taken. Well, I mean, this is, it's it's this idea of there's being vulnerable and admitting, yeah, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. Here's where things have gone wrong. As salespeople, we are trained to present a perfect front at all times, especially as sales trainers. Now that I'm a little bit more kind of 50, 50, you know, sales training and sales itself. It's this weird thing of we're, we're trained to show the perfection but we're not really trained with how to handle the imperfection. We're not really trained on how to handle when something goes wrong. When we talk about objection handling, but those are just like cheap tricks. 
how to really handle when your brain is telling you this is wrong, how to really handle when, you know, you can just tell you've, you've broken the trust of a client, how to handle when you can tell that your boss is doubting your skill, how to handle when five different things go wrong one week before the end of the quarter. And nobody talks about that. So nobody's going to speak up and ask for help. And if you can't speak up about that, how on earth are you going to speak up about the fact that you are primary income or that you have a disability or that you struggle with mental health, which I think most people do. They just don't admit it. It's just loaded. Are these topics you're going to explore? Because I'm really interested in all of these. Yeah, we're already exploring a lot of these, honestly. Yeah. And <laughs> our goal is, you know, and, and we definitely cover lots of light subjects and we cover lots of heavy ones with, we hope, or we at least think is a sense of humor. But it is this stuff of like, you know, when you feel like you are the only one going through something on your team, it's really hard to be vulnerable about it and to kind of bring it up. The thing that, you know, Ashley, while you were talking that I kept thinking about is, you know, they've done all this research that shows that when people look at a job description, when men look at something and they see like a list of qualifications and they have 60% of them, they'll apply for the job. Women predominantly will not apply for that job unless they have 100% of those qualifications. And I think that's kind of the difference, right? It's like doing a podcast, I'm sorry, but unless you have a ton of experience doing it, which I don't think anybody that does podcast does, we all are figuring it out as we go. And that is a really intimidating thing. And there's something that like men, for a variety of reasons, feel more comfortable doing those things. And women are a little bit more reticent to do them. You know, Ashley said something interesting that I thought about is, you know, most people are heads down, especially in the corporate world, they're kind of heads down. They're trying to make their number. They're trying to, you know, just get through the day so they can go home and have a cocktail. And they don't do much personal branding. And I felt like that when I was in the corporate world. But then when you go out on your own, you know, suddenly your schedule's a lot more clear (laughs) because you don't have a job anymore. And, and (laughs) (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like you can... Or you have like 10 of them. You you (laughs) haven't learned to delegate yet. And so... You need to build. Well, it's, it's even simpler than that. You need to build your brand and you're, it's this crazy thing that we do. And I actually have a post I'm working on around this, but so much of our identity as salespeople is tied up with the companies that we work with. So when that company changes or goes away or whatever, we have to completely rebuild our identity unless you have a personal brand that you can go back to that ties into the core of who you are. And this idea that you can be a sales person as a brand with your style and your whatever, and then take that to different companies is a very new idea. I think it's been around in like realty and car sales and a few other things for a while. It kind of harkens back to the old Rolodex. But the idea that you are not the company that you work for is new to tech. Yeah. But so here's where I think that the trouble is. So a lot of the work that I do and what I'm super passionate about, and I'm doing a lot more work on is personal branding. And, you know, I'm a big believer that I think that the personal brands of the sort of leadership of a company or employees of a company are one of the most critical parts of B2B marketing these days. I think Drift is a phenomenal example. And so I am working with a number of leaders and a couple of salespeople while helping them figure out their personal brands. I think what is particularly hard for salespeople is that oftentimes you're selling a product to an audience that is not you and is nothing like you. And you don't really have that much like, you know, innate interest in or expertise in outside of your role at this particular company. So I think there's a lot of salespeople that really struggle with figuring out how do I define my personal brand in a way that is going to resonate with the audience that I am targeting as a salesperson, but that isn't going to seem false or fake or to Ashley's point, if I leave this company and now sell a completely different product, I'm not going to have to start from square one. And so figuring out this sort of intersection between the product that you sell 
and the audience that you sell it to and your kind of personal expertise and interests and passion and all of that. And I think it's sometimes very challenging for salespeople because we also have sort of a tendency to kind of overthink it. I love that. That's such a good point. And it's interesting because somebody will land at a new company and they start posting all this stuff about like the company and how great it is and the industry and all this stuff. And then two years later, they go to a different one. It's like, hey, what happened to all that like stuff that, you know, what happened? Like, I thought you were super passionate about that. And now you're at a different company, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And the other quick note is I did a presentation at the outreach conference like a couple of years ago on exactly what you're talking about. It was like creating a Venn diagram of what your company likes and, and what you like and your passion and or something like that and trying to live in that little middle part. And that's really interesting to try to figure out how to be authentic in that way and build your brand. Absolutely. I think that is just speaking to our audience, that is especially hard to do when it's your first job, when it's your first time in tech, when it's your first time figuring out how to be a salesperson. Once you've been around, once you've been around the block a couple of times, you've been in sales, I mean, even six months, a year, it's a lot easier to know what is brand, what is a value, what is, you know, what the cornerstones of a corporate culture are versus going in from the outside. And it's really easy to, in your first interview, think everything's going to be something that it isn't. So there's also the interesting navigation of figuring out what it is that matters to you and how to not just identify it, but how to actually go and find it and figure out what the actual deal breakers are and what aren't. So, you know, we're talking about branding and culture and stuff like that, but something that comes up a lot just personally for me is healthcare. If the company doesn't have really, really good healthcare, I'm not working for you for many reasons. And that's something that I didn't know when I started in sales. I figured that out a few years in. So it's really interesting, like there's values and there's passions and there's also just the realities of life. Nobody talks about because people think, oh, salespeople are all coin operated, which we are. Not denying you dangle a hundred dollar bill in front of me, I will jump <laughs> for it. But I'm gonna try that. At the same time, it's also knowing I coach people all the time. Yeah, I won't jump very high, and I'll probably end up falling over and spraining my ankle. But I will jump for it. <laughs> Please don't do that on stage at <laughs> a conference. <laughs> I can just imagine this happening now. Oh, it's gonna go well. But it's not just the values and the passion. It's, as salespeople, you have to understand how you're going to live. You know, there's commission, there's base, there's salary, there's all these things. And you've got to make sure that you can literally keep a roof over your head and food in your mouth. And it's so easy to join a company and realize their comp plan is just screwy. And it's going to be really hard for you to make your number. Or I talk to people all the time who they accepted jobs where they were told, oh yeah, it's a hundred percent commission, but our average person makes you know, $90,000 a year or something like that. <laughs> it's so that like easy to knives? get those things <laughs> wrong when it's your first job. <laughs> oh, forget steak knives. I, I I've had, God, I get companies who will approach me still. I mean, oh, I'm sure there's tons of Kako people on here, tons of people who did solar, tons of people who did door to door pest control. And I love hiring these people, by the way, because there's nothing, the two jobs I think that are the hardest version of sales are anything door to door and anything trying to solicit donations. The people when you're walking down the street and they have the vest on. Yeah. If you've done either of those things, corporate sales is going to be a breeze. And yeah, guess what? My very first sales job was doing both in one job. That's right. Jehovah's Witness. No, Jehovah's Witness, do they ask for money? I don't think so. But no, door-to-door canvassing for like environmental causes when I was 19. And this was before I had tattoos and a septum piercing. So I was really preppy. And they would send me to all the most Republican neighborhoods because I was like so much preppier compared to everybody else. And I would spend like the whole evening having, you know, people scream at me and slam the door in my face. And it it was, it was really miserable. And it's, it was so awful. So every job was better after that. It it made me develop a very thick skin. I'm Googling stuff. And I'll say, I'll say this one. (laughs) 
uh, I'll say like a like, like oh, the bull, okay. like the bull <laughs> ring in my nose. Is what <laughs> Got it. David, what did you think it was? That's why I turn the videos off on these things. What, what were you saying? <laughs> No, first of all, Casey, I cannot imagine you crappy, yes. so I need photo evidence of this. <laughs> Two, <laughs> you guys will love this. I'm 100% with John Barrows and his daughter. My first sales job was really doing door-to-door cookie sales. Girl Scout, all that whole thing. And I was really good at that. I had so much fun with that. I had the market cornered. Literally, there were developments that like were pre-committed to buy from me before we went, it even went live. It was a thing. But... Later on, when I first came to the, the real world, one of my jobs in college, and I call it my first real sales job, it was telesales and it was working at Santa Clara University Student Call Center. And I washed out two weeks in, full on rage quit. I had someone chew me out one too many times. I said, screw this, took off my headset and walked out and drove home. I want to see, I want to see Ashley rage quit. So That's great. <laughs> <laughs> pictures it, it wasn't exciting it was literally just me walking out i kind of just want to see ashley i just want to see ashley rage at something i mean i've seen plenty of venting but i feel like rage <laughs> is on a whole other level and i would like to experience this that's because i vent i vent <laughs> so i don't rage she lets a little steam out but let me ask you a question so if someone's out there listening and they're like, okay, I don't look like the average tech bro and I, I want to build my brand and I want to do a pot or, you know, I just want to get out there and represent and, you know, build my brand and stuff. What should they do? Come Start. on the other side of sales. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, the big thing is just start. Don't overthink it. I think here's the problem that I see people make is they think way too hard about, oh, every tweet has got to be perfect or I've got to have this full plan and I need to craft everything. And it's like, no, you know what? One of the best things you can do is frankly, and I literally tweeted about this this morning, excuse my French in just a second, but throw shit at the wall. Like sometimes to get started, you just need to try a bunch of things you're going to figure out so quickly what feels authentic and what doesn't, what resonates with your network and your connections and what doesn't. And really quickly, you're going to start to be like, I love talking about this or, oh my God, I get these amazing responses when I talk about that. And you will start to feel more and more what is authentic for you and you'll gain some momentum. And I think the biggest thing is when you are just starting, the hardest part is just starting. I love just it. Just do it. I love it. Ashley, what do you think? Just start, test the market. Forget test the market. Like just start. Don't test the market. Yeah, just start. And Agree let me... and commit to putting something out there. I mean, the first thing I did content wise, someone asked me to write a blog for Brian Vital over at SDR Huddle. He said, hey, you know, you seem like you know what you're doing, you're at a good company, any interest in writing a blog post? And I'd been toying with that idea for like a year. And sure, that was like the impetus I needed. I just said, sure. And I did it. And I don't think many people read it. It was totally fine. But it showed me that the sky wasn't going to fall down. This is the other really key point is when you are just starting, guess what? Nobody's following you and they're probably not paying attention. So now is the yeah. time to do it. Like you don't have a lot at stake. And I will say like, so, you know, the first kind of thing that I did, and it was like my third video, I think on LinkedIn, but it was the first one that just like totally blew up. It was me being really fired up about something that I'd seen. And I recorded this video, one shot, completely off the cuff. It was my iPhone balancing on a stack of Post-its, leaning up against my computer monitor. And all I did was hit record. I ranted for about a minute and a half and I posted it on LinkedIn. Period. End of story. I didn't think twice about it. And it was in the afternoon. I woke up the next morning to 800 connection requests on LinkedIn. And like, that's what happens when you're just doing you. It's the times when I think too much about it, when I plan it, when I almost have a script. Those are the times when like literally no one comments and no one watches and it falls flat. 
people really want to see something that is genuine. And so that's the other thing I do is like, I encourage people to think about the stuff that gets you fired up. Think about when the times when you're like, you know, over drinks or coffee with a friend and you are just, you know, ranting off the cup or like talking a mile a minute because you're so passionate and so engaged on a topic. Those are the times that you really want to like, you want to repeat that and you want to share that. Don't overthink it. Just do you when you are sort of at your most you, whatever that means. Most people refer to Vanilla Soft as the solution. It's the solution to ensure sales reps make the right number of attempts for every lead across all channels, including email, social, and the phone. It's the solution to serve the rep the next best lead every single time. You need to get your solution at VanillaSoft.com. You don't want to force it. And I think that's what's tricky because probably people are thinking about this and they're going, well, you know, I work for this like data switching security cyber company and I don't really know what we do, but I'm in sales and, you know, like, like I'm not like super <laughs> yeah. passionate about what I'm doing. So what do I talk about? You know, I mean, I think that's where people might get stuck. As you know, I'll say this, as someone who came from hyper technical, I call it hard tech. Just to rattle off resume, like I cut my teeth. My first job was at Arista Network selling 10 gigabit Ethernet switches. I went to FireEye and was there during their IPO. I went over to Pernix Data, which was acquired by Nutanix. And then I was at a couple other companies and then landed at Okta. So my tech cred actually is pretty strong here. And the thing I wish I had done as an SDR, marketing departments always tell you, oh, share case studies and share this stuff that we're doing. One of the things that I found and I wish I had done more of was just share stories. I spoke with someone today who told me this. I'm really excited to share this product with them. You know, I just found out today, you know, that someone I spoke with six weeks ago bought this product to solve this problem. Just be a storyteller. And it's a simple thing. You don't have to get technical, but just be constantly reminding people of the value that you and by so by through you, your product brings to market. And if you can build that kind of momentum of just sharing cool stories of things that people are doing in your own words, four or five sentences, that's enough. Because the whole point of LinkedIn for that kind of more hardcore tech is A, to up your sales game by seeing what best practices and stuff you can get from people who are trying to share stuff to, to network for your own benefit, as well as to help find clients. And three, it's so when you call someone and they are trying to figure out if you're legitimate or not, or if your company is legitimate or not, they can see that you are a real person and a human being. So if all your feed is that you're putting out there is just sharing and resharing what marketing gives you, you just look like a mouthpiece. But if you're taking that and telling a story and adding a little bit from your own experience, it's really easy to start creating quote unquote content for yourself without sharing anything other than I spoke to a you know, top 10 bank who was having this problem. That's not traceable back to anyone. Nobody cares. But it gets the stories going. Right. And, and, so that, and that, that could be a pushback that you get is like, hey do I have to check with my, you know, marketing department or PR department or something before I start talking about this? Like if someone works at a big corporation. As long as you're not giving anything that is traceable, you shouldn't. So I'll give you an example. Like I worked at a company years ago who had Microsoft as a client and we were allowed to say on the phone that the world's largest software company was a client, but we weren't allowed to say Microsoft was a client because legal logic. Take that same tack with your post. Don't say the actual name of the person you connected with. Don't say the actual company that you connected with. But you can still say a leader in the retail space, a leader in the energy space, a leader in this space. You know, I just spoke with a new potential client out of San Francisco. You can do all sorts of things that are generic but allow you to just set, you know, to set the tail. I just spoke with someone who, or I just followed, you know, I heard that someone I spoke with a few weeks ago, you know, who had 20 people responsible for incident 
response and remediation. And they've now been able to cut that team in half and redeploy half that team to be focused on other initiatives. So they've been able to cut their timeline for other projects in half because their security you know, incidences were at half. You're telling a story that's not traceable back to an actual name. You could just say a large bank. Okay. And the other thing is, you know, we're always taught when we're growing up, don't toot your own horn, you know, don't like beat your chest or, you know, talk so great about yourself and all this stuff. And I think that gets ingrained. So how do you push through that initial resistance? Start doing it. So here's the thing. Don't. Don't toot your own horn. Don't use your social media to brag about what you're doing. Amen. Don't do it. Do it to add value. I hope I don't do it. No, you don't. Oh, thanks. And here's the deal. Like, so I don't love everything that Gary V does, but one of the things that I love that he says, and he says it in every one of his books, he says, if you are not at least 51% altruistic, this building a brand thing, this building a personal brand isn't for you. Just don't even try. So, you know, just what Ashley is talking about, you're sharing stories that you think might inform someone, might interest someone, might add to their day, inspire, anything like that. So make it about sharing knowledge make it about being somebody else's champion. So one of the best things you can do is say like, hey, I was struggling with this or I didn't have the answer to this question. And I went to this person and they took the time to sit me down and give me so much knowledge. And oh my goodness, it was so helpful. And I just want to publicly say thank you to them. I mean, There is something so incredible about that. No one is going to fault you for it. It will tighten your bond with that person. And it will, I don't know, restore people's faith that like there's good stuff happening. Don't toot your own horn. Toot somebody else's. I love that. (laughs) That's what I was going to say. Put it on them. That's a great idea. I want to do that. Let me ask you this. What if someone's out there and they're just not very attractive, you know, physically, and they're wanting to get out and do things and they're insecure about that. What advice would you give them? Well, a couple of things. One, I guarantee you think you are less attractive than everybody else thinks you are. We're all our worst critic. Two, if you're really afraid of video, there's a million kinds of non- like visual forms of content that you can share. So podcast, you know, I mean, we have this like old joke, you know, he has a face for radio. I mean, it's a really offensive thing to say, but like, you know, there's tons of things that you can do. Podcast being a great one, writing content, all kinds of things that you don't need that. But I will also say like, in general, one of the things that I think is most wonderful about what is happening in our I don't know, in kind of pop culture is there is a much wider acceptance and celebration of people with a much more sort of diverse set of appearances. And I think that, you know, the barriers to entry, it's not all just hot people that are getting exposure. And so, you know, in my experience, like people actually, you know, and granted, I don't speak about things like you know, video games or, you know, industries or niches that tend to be really hostile and have lots of trolls. I will say that, you know, in the sales world, people are damn supportive and people tend to be pretty kind and wonderful. And most of the responses you get are much more positive and celebratory and supportive than you even think they will. So figure out what is one little bit of the envelope you're willing to push and try it and see if that makes you just a little more confident to push it a little further. I love it. I'm motivated. I'm motivated. Ashley, what do you think? A couple things. One, don't, honestly, don't do anything you're not comfortable with. That, that's rule number one. If you're not comfortable with it, don't do it. Don't freak out about it. But as somebody who hates the sound of her own voice, can never find a picture that I feel like I look good in. And I'm very keenly aware that that is my own neuroses. I'm also very aware that I'm very lucky. I may be neurotic, but I also know that I'm not ugly by any stretch of the imagination. I just think I'm awkward and feel like I don't photograph well. But 
if you can be brave enough to do the thing that scares you, to do the thing that makes you uncomfortable, you will, I think, in general, be incredibly surprised with the response you will get. Because the world is only made better by more people pushing themselves to do the things that make them uncomfortable. And especially in an industry where we've gotten a lot better. I'm 100% with Casey with our whole society is getting better about this stuff. It's getting better. It's not great, but it's getting better. You only help drive that forward by putting yourself out there, even if it's as simple as getting that profile photo that's less retouched on LinkedIn or, you know, showing up in company videos or something like that. It's not the risk that you think it is. And if anything, you will probably inspire more people than you ever know. I think that's a really good point. And here's the analogy that (laughs) comes to mind for me. Okay. I think we've all been to like a karaoke bar where somebody gets up and they really don't have a great voice, but they sing that song with confidence and a little bit of bravado and they like straight up kill it, even though they're totally missing notes and they're not really a great singer because they're doing it with gusto. And there's something to be said for that. So figure out like what is the way that you can do something that's a little bit a little bit outside your comfort zone, but still in that comfort zone enough that you can do it with confidence and you can do it with a little bit of moxie because Ashley is exactly right. Like all you will wind up doing is inspiring others to take that leap with you. That's awesome. And I'll say this too. The one thing I've found is the only time I've gotten any negative pushback on looks or anything like that, all that has done is reaffirm that the people who give me that feedback are not people that I want involved in my career. They're not people that I'm going to rely on or that I'm going to go out of my way to stay in touch with. And if I see someone who is getting on someone else for their self-expression, and we actually just recorded an episode on unconscious bias. If I see someone in the workplace or networking or whatever, and they're criticizing someone's personality or the way someone presents themselves versus the content of what they're saying, that's a problem for them because I'm probably not going to choose to work with you in the future. If I'm interviewing for a job and I go into an office and this has happened, I've had someone made a comment about what I was wearing and, you know, they made something along the lines of, oh, is this your everyday sort of look? I definitely wasn't wearing anything scandalous, but I think it was like I wore a skirt or something like that. And they said that, oh, we've been told that, you know, pants are always best for interviews. And I was like, what? Like, great. I do not want to work here. So anyone who might respond negative, they're a dinosaur and they're on their way out. And if you're up for it, it's a chance for re-education. But if anything else, it's going to make it really easy to figure out who your friends and your allies are. 100%. I mean, I would think that it's good that it's a generally positive environment because I would think that there would be a lot of weirdos out there, you know, on social media. I thought there would be a lot more weirdos. And I will just tell you, I have one weirdo story where I accidentally stepped on something on like in my foot and hurt my foot and my foot swelled up like crazy. <laughs> and I posted a disgusting picture uh, on my Instagram of my really swollen foot. And then I got two text messages from numbers I didn't recognize about like hoping my pretty feet will heal. And it was like, oh Oh, my God. But it was one of those things where it's like no follow-up. There was nothing filthy. And it was like a one message of like, I hope your pretty feet heal. And it was like, okay, that's really weird and creepy. But like literally that's by far the worst. Well, I think just having this conversation with you, there's a minefield. It's a minefield of doing this, what you guys are doing. You know, I mean, it's like people, they have busy lives. They're managing all these things. You know, everybody's got insecurities about putting yourself out there. And then you got the weirdos and you got the text messages. You know, there's so many things holding people back from just getting out there. It ends up being just a bunch of the same faces all the time, you know? So Yeah. And I'll say this. I'll push back on that. I totally understand that's what people think. I think one of the things we want to say is, Those are the monsters in the closet. They feel way bigger than they are when you open the door. Yep. Step through, be, have that, you know, put on your power up song, try it. Pull up your pull up. Yeah. Put on your big girl pants. (laughs) 
Do your power pose. I love it. I just see you doing this right now. This is great. Whatever it comes from. But here's the other thing. Also, find your find your supporters. And I think Ashley and I both will volunteer to be the first among those if you don't have them. One of the things that I think has been most incredible for me over like the last year or two is that I've put a lot more intention into, I don't know, building my kind of like work tribe. And Ashley and I, it's like, you know, we had a call not that long ago where it was like, we basically just took turns venting about things. And man, it becomes so much easier to move on and get to that next step. A whole group of people in your corner. So take the time to reach out to people that you just think seem cool and interesting and be like, hey, you seem cool. I would like to get to know you. Could we get on a call sometime or could I take you to coffee? And start to make those connections because one, the world is a much less scary place when you have those. It becomes much easier to get over the hard stuff or the weird stuff or the creepy stuff when you can then make a joke about it to your people. And it is awesome when you do something that you are totally terrified of and you can send an email to those like 10 or 15 people in your corner and say, hey, I just did this thing and I'm totally terrified of it. What do you think? And nine times out of 10, they're all going to come back and be like, good for you. Maybe they'll give you some good feedback too, but they're going to be there to support you. And it's going to give you that little bit of fuel that gets you to take that next leap. I love it. Having that support network, you know, sometimes you get deer in the headlights. You're deer in the headlights. You're like, I need to talk to somebody. Somebody help me. Oh yeah. It's great. Well, or even worse, your instinct. And I think this is the instinct for a lot of salespeople, when things start going wrong, your instinct is to turtle. Yep. It's to go inward and, oh, the problem's with me. Everyone else is everyone's succeeding. Crushing it. You know, maybe ask a couple of coworkers what media. they're doing. God, yeah, everyone's media crushing it. Why should I? Why? Yeah. What the What's wrong, wrong with me? me? Everybody's so happy. Yeah. You know. Except me. <laughs> why, why can't I make this work? Why don't people? They do. You're not alone. Everyone anyone's goes through this. Anyone's out there. Anybody. Yeah. And it's not a question of whether or not you're going to struggle. It's a question of when and how often. And the answer is constantly. And that's okay. And that's also why, like, you know, and Ashley and I talk about this quite a bit also, is that, you know, for those of you out there that tend to be a little more comfortable with this kind of stuff, and I put myself in the oversharing category of life, I kind of take it as like my personal responsibility to overshare and overshare quite publicly so that other people recognize that like, yeah, okay. You know, even when people are building their personal brands or doing things that you think are cool, they're also still struggling with the day to day and they're just human. And if you think that that's not the case, it's just because they're better at hiding it and you're, you know, better at letting them get away with that. Interesting. Well, okay. So the podcast is called The Other Side of Sales and it's now available on iTunes, right? That's exciting. It is. All of the major platforms. It is super exciting. Finally, there's another side of sales that we could talk about instead of these crushing it, Patagonia wearing all birds. Everybody goes to the same barbershop. I love it. I love what you're doing and I'm going to go subscribe right now. Thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us, Casey and Ashley. Even Ashley as well, for sure. Did Ashley drop off? Are you mad at me? <laughs> no, she's no, <laughs> no. Honestly, I was laughing at Casey saying responsibly to overshare. I think that is the one thing oh. my husband hates about that. <laughs> I know the relationships come up at least once in every podcast, huh? <laughs> Oh, without a doubt. You can't. I mean, you know, you got to bring it back to what you know. So, yeah, like it hasn't come up yet on this one. So that's good. But I just want to thank you. Well, your wife is amazing. So. I know. Well, you know, I'm very blessed to have her on the team. She just had a huge project and now she can come back to helping us with 10 bound a little bit. So I'm very, very blessed to have her. And actually... She's trying to help me to go and pick up the kids. And I'm going to go pick up the kids right now and hopefully not be late. So uh, (laughs) I want to thank you guys for (laughs) making the time. Okay. Thank you so much. It was a great experience. This has been fun. Yeah, definitely. 
Everybody go over to other side of sales, subscribe, get on this more conversations like this. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the sales development podcast. The only audio forum, 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.